in my experience, kids are like, they're carb seeking missiles. <laughs> they, they will find carbs and eat them no matter <laughs> where they are. And, and, and that'll generally be uh, all the time. So for our main meals, we try and eat protein sources, vegetables and fruits because they're going to get the carbs some other way. They're going to get crackers and chips and cookies or whatever. And so we don't ban that at all in our house. We just don't serve it during meals because they find it. Welcome to Coach Carlisle's Pursuit of Excellence podcast show. Brought to you by Carlisle Performance Training Systems located in San Jose, California. As a parent who has athletic children, have you ever been charged with having to bring snack for your kid's athletic team? Do you know what your child should be eating before, during, and after an athletic competition? How do you get your kid to buy into eating properly on a consistent basis so that they may achieve optimal health, not only on the playing field, but in life and establish life habits? What about yourself? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you doing the things necessary while you're on the go, shuttling your kids to and from athletic competition in addition to having a professional life and so forth? Are you doing the things that you need to do to maintain optimal health through sound nutritional strategies? Well, we've got an episode for you that will provide those answers. Dr. John Barati, founder of Precision Nutrition, an international nutrition expert, provides actionable strategies and solutions to educate you in the areas that we just mentioned. There's a lot of take homes from this. Dr. Barati founded Precision Nutrition. They have coached and mentored more than 200,000 people in nearly 100 countries. In fact, their certification program has certified over 100,000 counselors, doctors, exercise specialists, naturopaths, nutritionists, personal trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, the list goes on. His background is unmatched in the area of nutrition. And today we have Dr. John Varadi as a guest, and he's going to answer practical questions and give you meaningful strategies that's very simple to implement to help you give your child the best that you can give them as well as yourself from a nutrition standpoint. Without further ado, here he is, Dr. John Barati. Dr. John Barati, how you doing, Doc? Oh, I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. It's great to talk to you and see you today. And uh, I'm excited to talk about performance and sports and uh, nutrition and all the, all those things. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you, when we were in Portland, this is probably five or six years ago, we were just sitting down and we were chopping it up, talking about parenting and talking about sports and talking about what we were doing. I, I just, it was one of those conversations I relish and, and I'm very thankful for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always think about that too. Whenever your name comes up, I remember the Nines. I think that's the name of the hotel in Portland yeah, that yeah, we were yeah. at. Nike would always put us up at this posh hotel and uh we ran into each other kind of accidentally in the restaurant and we spent a couple hours chatting and it was great it was great i always think back to that and uh, i always think about the kind of shared values we express there and uh you know the uh, the fact that we don't get enough chances like that to hang out sure sure well if you wouldn't mind starting off by just telling people who don't know who you are a little bit about who you are and your background and journey gasp people don't know who i am Shame <laughs> on just kidding no i i uh you know my name is john berardi obviously and i um years ago started a company called precision nutrition and uh precision nutrition was just born out of a personal passion of mine which was uh, i was an athlete um but before i was an athlete uh, i was born premature and was very sick as a kid so i was always carrying around my puffer and i was going for allergy shots and 
asthma and the whole deal. So, you know, when I was really young, my mom wouldn't actually let me participate in sport because she thought something bad was going to happen to me. I come from an immigrant family. So uh, the old Italians were just like, keep them in the house, you know? So, um, so when I got to high school and I, I wanted to participate in sport, I started reading up on exercise and training and nutrition. I really became fascinated with that as a way to, if you want to say, kind of heal myself. Um, and that was my avenue for becoming nerdy on all these things. And then as I got into that and I started eating better and training and I built some muscles, I got to play sports and uh, my asthma and allergies were totally well managed. I thought, man, this is so fascinating. I like maybe I'll go study this in school. And then, you know, I did my undergrad and pre-med and thought maybe I'd be a doctor. But then um, the call to sort of exercise and nutrition was just too strong. I even applied to med schools wow. and, and I got accepted to a few and I, then I had a moment of clarity where I was like, you know what, this, uh, first of all, when you come from an immigrant family, becoming a doctor or a lawyer is like the greatest accolade <laughs> you could achieve, right? That's just be, if my parents would always say, yeah, you get that, you get that degree that become a doctor. No one can ever take that away from you. And I never understood that as a kid. And then I realized, well, you know, they grew up in post world war II Italy, uh, people were taking things away from them. You know what I mean? Right, That's why they want to say that. Right. And so, but at the same time, I, um, I realized it was, you know, the med school thing was maybe to, uh, please my family. And also it felt like a big challenge. I heard it was hard to do. Um, but I just had this moment of clarity where I'm like, but I don't love that. I'm not passionate about that. So I went and did a master's in exercise science instead. Um, People thought it was totally nuts for making that choice over med school. And then that sort of led me to my PhD work in uh, exercise and nutritional biochemistry. And while, while I was doing that school, I was so into the subjects. Uh, I don't want to sound sort of boastful here, but school is like super easy because I was just passionate about it. Like this is stuff I've been reading since I was a teenager. Um, so it, school was easy. So I was like, I got all this free time. I'm going to start start a business on the side and that was sort of the early days of precision nutrition you know back then uh there were just a couple of us and we were coaching people online we had one of the first ever online coaching businesses um and this is you know nowadays everyone's online what year was this this was like 2000 okay so we had so we built this website called science link which was the johnberardi.com website and um, it, I mean, there were no experts had websites back then that we were like one of the first expert websites in the entire field, you know? And so I, people were on dial up back then. That's, I mean, that's how long ago it was. AOL. You know, huh? <laughs> yeah. High speed internet. <laughs> um, and just a few years prior, I got my first email account. Like people didn't even have home computers, right? They, I, I remember like I would go to the computer lab during my master's work to type up, you know, my, my, uh, essays. That's the first time I ever had to type up essays. Like before that they were all handwritten. I, I know I'm making myself sound like a hundred years old, but this was, this wasn't that long ago. Not you at know? All. And so, you know, we built this website, we started doing online coaching and this was anyone, you know, from athletes to people who want to look and feel better. And as my reputation grew, I was, I was writing and stuff like that. Uh, and it was primarily just the stuff I learned. I was learning. Uh, I would spend one day every week uh, at the library in the uh, research journal section. So the library and my PhD work was, there was just one floor devoted to bound, you know, paper bound uh, journals, scientific journals. So I'd spend one day a week just browsing through them, looking for interesting studies. And then and this is quite independent of schools, just personal interest. And I just write about them and whoever would publish them or I publish them on my own site. And then I started getting calls from professional sports teams and Olympic sports teams to come do lectures and work with the athletes. And so it sort of all started out in this sort of, you know, a little bit of one-on-one -on -one online coaching and then a little bit of sort of lecturing and athlete consultation and stuff like that. And then, you know, when I graduated with my, my PhD, that's when we we're, you know, my business partner, I decided, Hey, maybe we should, really focus on precision nutrition. And then we started producing information products and scaling up our coaching. And then 
our coaching business just went kind of crazy because we were the only ones doing online coaching back then. So I was building up a reputation internationally. So now if you're sitting in Florida or someone sitting in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, or someone sitting in Loughborough, England, um, they could all get me as their coach or one of my coaches as their coach. So this online coaching thing kind of exploded. And um, then a lot of professionals came to us sort of asking, oh, can you teach me your methods? And that's when we created the Precision Nutrition Certification, which um, has actually even eclipsed our coaching. You know, uh, on the coaching side, we've coached close to 200,000 clients since we started. But on the uh, certification side, we're over 100,000 professionals incredible. certified now. That's incredible. So you know, it's been it's been awesome. Like, you know, for someone like you, you get it. Like, you, you get into this field <laughs> because you think there's a secure career path for you. There's tons of money at the end of the rainbow. Yeah, just because you, like, can't help yourself. You're like, I, I don't know. I love this so much. And uh, I know I, pr I probably shouldn't even do this, but I'm going to go into this field and I'm going to see where it takes me. And then um, it's been a it's been a wild ride to have so many people put their trust in me and our company uh, with their own health and with the health and fitness of their own clients and patients. This episode is brought to you by Carlisle Performance Training Systems, transforming athletes into champions. Located in San Jose, California, now a hundred thousand people that are certified, precision nutrition certified. Yeah, my wife being one of them. Yeah, so it's now, amazing. I know. Yeah, I'm yeah. so excited to see her come through. Yeah, awesome. Now tell me this. How many different countries are people certified in? A uh, hundred now. One hundred uh, countries. We, we have one of our, um, our our curriculum developer, Dr. Krista Scott Dixon, who is just amazing, an amazing person, amazing educator. Um, she's doing a tour of Asia right now. So she's, I think, doing 10 different cities. Uh, so there's could be a few thousand people seeing her speak in in Asia and so uh you know we have people down in Australia and New Zealand right now so it's it's super cool to see uh the reach and the impact and even you know I'm uh, you know I'm America for example Canada even through proximity I think has had access to some really great innovation in nutrition and exercise and sport training and stuff like that and then uh, I don't know if you've been over to lecture in China yet, but you know, starting to see the seeds of the industry, like the things we saw 15 years ago here, start to take root over there is is really quite exciting because uh, not only is it so uh, young and early, and you have this opportunity to sort of help shape it, but also it's sort of evolving in its own way because of their own unique culture and stuff like that. So it's it's actually quite cool to see. We talk about scaling. You certainly have done a great job of that. How many people are on board now with Precision Nutrition in terms of staff and employees? Yeah, it's it's cool. I mean, we're probably uh, probably around 120 to 130 people wow. on our team right now. When you know, depends a fewer contractors, um, you know, that kind of doing all their work with us, but they may be in another country, so they're still contractors. But uh, yeah, it's between 120 and 130 people. You know, our our website's getting two, three million visitors a month. So it's, uh, it's the, the reach is impressive to even me, you know, again, thinking back to the early days and yeah. being like, Hey, look, uh, a thousand people came to our website this month, you know, and being super proud of that as we should have been. And then now looking at, wait, wait, uh, I'm a little sad if less than 3 million are going to come in November here, <laughs> you know? Wow. Unbelievable. Now, I'm so wrapped up in the story, it's just, <laughs> it's just engrossed in it. Topic of today, and it's, it's one that is appropriate for someone like you who is a mega professional in the field. In addition to that, you're a dad, husband, you got four kids, and you're, you're ripping and running, doing your thing. One of the common challenges that you see are parents who are supporting their athletic children. And at the same time, they're, they've got a life to live. And oftentimes with their health, their nutrition gets put on the back burner. We know mm -hmm. as parents who have kids, we're just running 
We're running yeah. and gunning and doing all the things. And, and on top of that, parents will oftentimes forget, oh, well, here I am supporting my kid. Maybe I shouldn't be giving them cookies in between games and candy in between games. I'm the candy parent. So <laughs> let's, the topic of today is how to support and do the right thing as a parent and support your child nutritionally to make sure that they're, we're doing the best by them to help them recover in between games and perform as well as you as a parent. So where would you mm -hmm. start with that, Doc? Yeah, I, I, uh, I always try and piece out this conversation into three separate things. Okay. You know, the first is most of the people listening to us will probably be on board with wanting to eat better for themselves and help their children eat better. Um, and generally, uh, it's been my experience that folks like that get really judgmental of the other folks, you know? Uh, so let's say, for example, you you and I had a, our children were on the same soccer team or track team or whatever, and we saw some of the other parents, and it was their day to bring snack, and they brought a bunch of stuff we didn't think was ideal. Yes. You know? And then, then we'd be upset with them and judgmental about it, and you know, my, my take is that, you know, first of the first thing I always remember is we're all humans, just humaning, you know, we're just trying, they're trying their best. Now they may have a lack of knowledge. They may have a lack of information. They may have all kinds of things going on in their lives that you don't know about. But it's really easy to pretend their life is just like yours and be super easy for them to do the right thing like you. So the first thing I think about in that context is just how, how are you as a community member? Right? Because if your kids in, are in sports and you're attending the events, uh, whether you like it or not, you're part of this community. And uh, uh, you know, no one likes the know-it-all a-hole who shows up and judges everyone for their nutritional choices. Right. You know, so that's the first thing. So, sort of, uh, how are you showing up in the community? Is it uh, at a place where you want to? help with education or help with other people's process or move them slowly to better, you know, and that can include who, whoever brings the snacks for the kids. It can include the coaches, you know, are you, are you showing up in a way that expresses sort of compassion and empathy for uh, who they are and how they are and helps them move along. Right. Uh, a lot of people aren't, especially people who are passionate about health and fitness, they show up and there's judgment immediately. So that's my first thing. How are you showing up if you're doing the right thing? Most people aren't showing up well as a good community member, as an empathic, compassionate person. Now, let's go to the parent themselves. So you, if you want to do better, you know, you talked about putting it on the back burner. The truth is probably your self-care has to go on the back burner sometime. If you have ambitious career goals and you've got children and I mean, right now, you know, uh, you know how life works, the, the seasonality of life when there's summer and then there's fall and all the new programs kick in. And, you know, so I just redid my schedule you know, a month and a half ago. And uh, as I'm plugging everything into my Google calendar, I'm counting up the hours that I'm simply at taking kids to and from kids programs and sitting at kids programs. And I'm like, wow, I'm going to be doing kids programs 25 hours a week this fall, you know? So that's, uh, that's more than a half time job, right? Right. So to have a super high nutrition standard for myself and my kids, uh, in the midst of, you know, working, let's say a 40 hour week, then working this other 25 hour part-time job of taking kids to stuff and sitting around while they're at their things or, or whatever you choose to do. I mean, I choose to, participate as much as I can. So for example, my daughter does gymnastics. So instead of sitting in the room with the parents, I hired a gymnastics coach to teach me gymnastics so I can be working out at the same time. And my daughter can see me, you know, expressing my own physicality and um, her friends can be like, wow, that's super cool that your dad works out when you do, you know? So that's, that's part of my whole paradigm. You know, if the kids are in soccer, I'll do, intervals on the track that's adjacent to the field or do some of my track workouts. So, you know, it's one of my pieces of advice for parents is 
uh, instead of just sitting while your kids are doing physical activity and checking your phone or reading a book, uh, hey, why aren't you doing something physical as well, both right. as an example and using that time effectively, you know? So all of this is to say that people are busy, I get it. Uh, nutrition and certain aspects of health care or self-care will go on the back burner. The key is just not to turn the burner off, right? Like you're not going to strive for perfect nutrition if you're a parent of four kids and you got all these programs and stuff, but the alternative isn't no nutrition, right? So I always think about uh, life as sort of a series of dials. You know, there's your, there's your sort of sleep dial, your stress management dial, your food dial, your exercise dial. And, you know, you know, I compete in track and field. So when uh, I got Canadian nationals coming up, uh, the training dial goes way up and some of the spend time with my family dial goes a little bit down. Right. But that might be for a short period of time while I'm preparing for a quote unquote big meet. They're not big meets when I mean, you're at the master's level, they're fun. But um, so, you know, but then the rest of the year, you got to turn that dial down. So, you know, what, what I help people come up with parents in particular is um, how do you turn your dial down on exercise and nutrition so that you're getting the minimum effective dose of what's healthy, of what's good for you without necessarily doing what you would do if you're training for a competition, but without turning it off to zero. So some tips and strategies for that, you know, one is you have to just think in advance. You have to be prepared, you know, knowing that like, it's not a surprise when your kid has soccer on Tuesday night. It's not like, whoa, where did that come from? Right. Or track or football or whatever. Um, so you knew that was coming. So think about it early in the week. Think about it early in the day. Um, you talked about candy parent, right? Uh, bring a candy bar along as a snack. You're like, ah, oh, I didn't have time to cook. But, but there's other things at the store that you got the candy bar at. You know, there's, there's, you can get vegetables almost anywhere. Or you can get a fruit almost anywhere. You can get mixed nuts almost anywhere. You can get a protein bar, which is a slight improvement over a candy bar. You know, so you start thinking in terms of a food continuum, which is what we teach at Precision Nutrition. There's not just good foods and bad foods. And if you don't give them the best food, then it doesn't matter what the rest is. It's a continuum. You know, there's um, a uh, organic, lovingly grown pear, you know, along with a free range piece of chicken might be on the one side of the perfect good food continuum. Um, and then the other side of the continuum may be being like a, um, a spam sandwich on the bathroom floor at the airport. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That would be like a horrible choice. <laughs> There's all kinds of gradations in between. Right. And so we just look for what they are. You know, we've done infographics on our site for how to pick up, healthier options at gas stations, you know, convenience stores, these kind of things so that it's, you know, you don't have to be slaving over the, uh, over the kitchen stove and cooking uh, 23 meals in advance and putting it in well-organized Tupperware and stacking it in the fridge to be doing a good job for yourself and your children when it comes to food choices. Um, there, there's alternatives in between. And I would suggest that you should be looking for those alternatives instead of, airing on the let's do it perfect you know i we always have this saying that um that uh when people a lot of people default to all or nothing right but when you do that you usually get the nothing not the all right so we always strive for always something which is how can i do a little bit today that's an improvement so if you brought a candy bar last week what's a little better than a candy bar this week it doesn't have to take lots of extra time you don't have to do it perfect you know, it's just what's a little better than that. And if you're bringing snacks for the other kids, the same, you know, and then what's, what about that for you, right? Um, making the commitment to yourself. So that's, that's sort of the mental framing around all of this. You know, it's how are you showing up as a community member? How are you showing up for yourself? And then how are you showing up for your child? Always remembering that, you know, always something is better than all or nothing. Outstanding. So now, Dr. John Barati is showing up for his daughter 
It's it's your day to bring the snack at gymnastics practice. What are you bringing? Yeah. Give me a couple couple things of what you would bring. Yeah, totally. So, um, I uh, generally they'll they'll be cut up vegetables. So we'll usually have, and and this is incidentally kind of what our kids eat at all their meals. So cut up uh, cucumbers, cut up carrots, cut up green, red, yellow, and orange peppers. Then we'll do cut up apples, oranges, pears, peaches, you know, whatever, bananas. And then we'll do some kind of protein. So it might almost like I, I was talking with Kelly and Juliet Starrett about this. Uh, some of your listeners may know Kelly. And you probably know Kelly as well. Oh, yeah. Um, they call it like a char charcuterie board, right? So it would be like, you know, venison or beef pepperettes without a whole bunch of additives and preservatives so little you know what i think some people call them jerky right so it'd be like healthy meat jerkies it might be like salami it might be these kind of things so it's basically vegetable chopped up vegetable chopped up fruits and some kind of protein source and then they, and then they drink water and so i mean ultimately that's that's how we eat at home like our you know I have this philosophy on eating, which is it's not a low carb, right? People are gonna, adults are gonna rush into this space. Kids don't think about this at all, but adults will rush into this. Well, it sounds like you give your kids a low carb diet. Not really, because in my experience, kids are like, they're carb seeking missiles. <laughs> they, they will find carbs and eat them no matter <laughs> where they are. And, and, and that'll generally be uh, all the time. So for our main meals, we try and eat protein sources, vegetables, and fruits, because they're going to get the carbs some other way. They're going to get crackers and chips and cookies or whatever. And so we don't ban that at all in our house. We just don't serve it during meals because they find it. They find it in other ways. There's always a bake sale. There's always a kid who brought that to gymnastics. Oh, my friend brought cookies and goldfish crackers. And, uh, and I had a few. So it's well, then perfect. Uh, then we're not going to have that at dinner. We're going to have carrots and cucumbers and peppers and apples and pears and chicken uh, thighs or chicken drumsticks or uh, hamburger or pork chops or whatever. And um, so we sort of extend that outside the house too. Like when we're preparing meals, it's fruits, vegetables, and meats. And then the rest of the day, they can get whatever other kind of carbs they're going to get. There's no don't eat that stuff because they're going to find it in uh, I, I, instead of putting a prohibition on it, I just know their carbs and junk food, quote unquote, is controlled because they don't get it during meals. They just get it the rest of the time. This episode is brought to you by Carlisle Performance Training Systems, transforming athletes into champions located in San Jose, California. People can't see how shredded you are. All right. Because we're, we're, <laughs> we're on Zoom. <laughs> and let me tell you, folks, audience, he's shredded. Every time he's picking up his coffee cup, his bicep has hit me in my eye. Right? So now, look, you're a master's track athlete. We talked about that a while back in, back in Portland. In addition to that, you talked about how you're, you, know, you work out alongside your daughter and during mm -hmm. your, during, when they have practice. So prior to your workout, what would you eat? Yeah. So for me, my, my diet is minimum effective dose. You know, I eat three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay. You know, what do I eat in those meals? Usually I make myself a big vegetable omelet for breakfast. So it's mostly egg whites, but I throw a whole egg or two in, um, and then loads of vegetables. So onions and peppers and all kinds of good stuff, uh, greens, and then alongside that, I usually have decaf coffee. Coffee ramps me up way too much. I don't like the feeling that I get. So sort of a high anxious person naturally. So I do a lot of things to combat that. So I keep my caffeine at a minimum. I do a lot of mindfulness work and quiet thinking. And, um, and then usually I have a piece of like uh, sourdough, sourdough bread with that. And that's breakfast, you know, and then Usually some hours later, I'll, I'll get around to lunch and usually that'll be either I'll cook the same thing again because I, I love omelets or I'll make, you know, an extra lean beef hamburger, make a huge salad, maybe have a, 
potato or sweet potato or something with that. And then usually I will, again, if I'm with the kids at one of their activities, I'll, I'll, I'll do some activity with them. Um, my daughter is also in like a rock climbing uh, group. So I'll bring our son who's six and we'll do bouldering while she's climbing. And then usually I'll come home, put them to bed. Then we have a home gym, so I'll work out in the home gym. Uh, and then I'll have a meal afterwards. And that meal looks a lot like lunch, but I'll add in a bunch of extra carbs. Um, and then that's it's pretty much that. During my workout, I usually have a drink with essential amino acids and creatine in it. And that's it's, it's really that simple. Just three meals a day, good amount of protein, loads of vegetables, very simple, you know. Uh, if we didn't have all these kids, you know, they weren't so young, <laughs> yeah. uh, my wife, Amanda and I would probably go out to eat more times than we do right now. And then we, that's where we'd have like a little bit more adventurous food options, but you know how it is, you know, you, your kids are young. You're not taking them all out to a restaurant. <laughs> it's ruined it for everybody, including you. Um, so you just hang at home and you, you do the bare minimum required on food and fitness and all that. And you just keep your kids alive, show them love, get them to their things and work on what you got to work on, you know? So for me, it's, there's not a lot of uh, attention or s systematic experimentation going on with any of my stuff. My track workouts are so basic, you know, it's just do what, do what I got to do. The minimum I got to do, my weight training workouts are the same. And so is my food uh, because the key is consistency. Right, you do this for ten, or twenty, or nearly thirty years in my case, and you and you don't really miss. Uh, things work out pretty good, you know. Yeah. So I've I've learned this with decades of experience and loads of clients. Um, the thing that you can do, I, I often say, when you design your plan, whether it's your training plan or your nutrition plan, design it with your worst day in mind the day that everything's going to go wrong so that you can still do it because there's going to be lots of those days. Right. And yeah. if you design it with your best day in mind on the worst day, it's not going to get done. Right. And then on the best day, if you got a little extra time, a little, a little extra energy or a little less stress, do a little more than what your plan said. You know what I mean? It's way worse to plan the big thing, big workout, big nutrition day, and it get derailed, then the plan, the little workout, the little nutrition day, always be able to do it and then just ramp it up. That's way better. It's way easier. It's way more sustainable. So that's, that's really it. You know, I, I, I feel like I'm going to set all the world records in track when I'm 90, because I'm going to be the only guy still doing it. I'm going to be the only guy who found a way to be consistent for 40 years, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So now, we're going to put our parent hat on. A lot of parents work out in the morning before work. Let's say you choose to work out at 6 a.m. You roll out mm -hmm. of bed. You roll out of bed at 5.15. You have a home gym. You're going to kickstart that workout. Yeah. What would you recommend someone eat prior yeah, to the I workout? Mean First of all, I never work out early. Okay. That, would hurt my, that would hurt my soul. But for those of you who have to do that, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> compassion and sympathy goes out to you. Um, yeah, no. What I what I would probably do is eat eat nothing. You know, I would probably I would probably have uh, I don't know whatever your beverage of choice is. Whether if, if you drink coffee regularly, I definitely have that before I got started. If not, I have a huge glass of water and then bring a liter of water out with me. Um, I think that, uh, the idea of, again, if you're a competitive athlete, the story changes completely, but if you're exercising for health and longevity and small incremental performance increases as an adult, you don't need sports nutrition. Um, and again, this isn't me minimizing whatever goals you may have. Again, I compete in master's level track and I like to do well. But I don't do anything fancy and I don't think fancy is required at this age or any of that. So I just, I'd have water or I'd have coffee or whatever. I'd go out and have a good workout. I might add like a, a protein shake, like just a scoop of protein and water or essential amino acids and water and sip that while I'm working out. Uh, and then I just have a great breakfast afterwards. 
I, I really think that, um, you know, the, when, when you're eating the right foods and exercising regularly, your body is able to unlock the food that's stored on it. So you can, you can go for a whole day without eating and then have a hard workout and be fine if your physiology is working right. You know, and I, I did, I published this book six years ago now on intermittent fasting where I tried all the popular intermittent fasting protocols and documented everything and did blood work and did performance measures and all that. And this is when I first started. It was, this was actually what kicked off my re-entry into track because I hadn't done it in 20 years and I was too muscular and heavy at the time. You know, I was close to 200 pounds and I knew I had to be less to run well and not get hurt. So I started all this intermittent fasting stuff. And now I did a trip to England one time. I was going to do a talk on intermittent fasting and I wanted to prove a point. So I fasted for 48 hours straight, got to England, got on stage and was like, I'm here to do a talk on intermittent fasting. And I want you to know, I ate my own dog food. I, yeah, I haven't eaten 48 hours. You know, I, I flew from Canada here, haven't eaten anything and I feel fine. Now, if I pass out during this session, you'll know why, <laughs> but I did fine and I did great. And, you know, I think the key to that is not, oh, fasting is amazing. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's that when you're healthy, when you move, when you make good food choices, when you are eating, your body is able to unlock the food that's stored on your body. Like there's very few of us who are so lean that there's no meals stored on us, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, I think waking up in the morning and working out fasted is easier because you can just have a drink and go out. You don't have to worry about cooking or eating or, you know, eating the right things. So you don't feel too full. Um, but the key to that is making sure that you have a regular routine of good eating choices after you work out until the next workout. So that's, that would be my advice um, for people there. Now, if it's someone with hypoglycemic episodes, again, I probably just want something fast. I'll probably have like an apple, some mixed nuts and a piece of venison jerky or something like that. Um, and then have a good meal after. But again, I think for most people working out fasted is fine. If you can unlock the food that's on your body and the way to do that is not eat too many carbs, generally not eat too much sugar, have a mixed diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, good protein, and then you're good. All right, Doc, one of the things you mentioned was how are you showing up in the community? So you have, you're invited to speak to a youth sports organization, maybe mm -hmm. your child's gymnastics club, and the parents are there sitting on the edge of the seat because they want to learn to show up better and support one another in the community. And at the same time, they want to learn what should I, what should we be providing to our kids as it relates to helping them, helping to support them nutritionally. Yeah. What would be the three things that you would share with your fellow parents of that organization with regard to helping to support that? Yeah. So let's, uh, we'll start with the food, you know? So what I'd probably do is I'd probably do it in pictures rather than words. Okay. It's way easier to put up a slide with uh, some nice photography and show versus tell, you know? So, and, I, I, and I've gone to speak to young children as, as young as grade one at schools to do nutrition talks. And those talks are almost all pictures, right? Sure. Got some really cool graphics with fun fruits and vegetables. And we do some fun stuff here at home. Like we make, we make characters out of vegetables. So you take a pepper and you get green beans and you stick them in for arms and legs. <laughs> and you make fun stuff like that around the house when the kids are really young to just make this whole experience of vegetables fun. And when people come visit us, they're often like, you know, and, and we have our own, our own challenges with, you know, certain aspects of eating as a family, but they're like, man, we've never seen kids so enthusiastically eat vegetables like ever, you know? And uh, I, I, I think that's a testament to the process. Like, I, I don't think we got, uh, blessed with vegetable loving children magically, you know, <laughs> yeah. it was, it's just a process and wasn't always easy and hasn't, it isn't always easy consistently, you know, it's not utopian eating over here. Um, but yeah, with those parents, I, I, number one, I'd share some of the stories of how, how we've done it. Um, in terms of integrating the food, you know, 
but I'd start with just pictures, you know, here's what a great meal would look like, you know, here's uh, four slices of chopped up pepper, here's apple, here's pear, here's a portion of protein for a child. Uh, and this is what, this is what we feed. Here's what a breakfast looks like. Here's what a lunch looks like. Here's what a dinner looks like. They're not really that different. Uh, how do you choose the vegetables and the proteins on the plate? Uh, you choose them by asking your kids. You know, I, I, I think, you know, there's a dance in coaching, whether you're coaching movement, whether you're coaching sport, whether you're coaching food, whether you're a counselor or therapist, there's a dance. There's, there's what I know to be true. That's good for you. And there's, you, the expert of you. So let's play that little game to figure out who you are, what you need. Our six-year-old son is our pickiest, quote unquote, of eaters. And I just know he loves four kinds of vegetables and four kinds of fruits and none others. So that's just the ones he gets all the time. And he eats them enthusiastically. Now his brother, who's four, sits right next to him at the table, gets different vegetables and fruits. It's really easy to chop up vegetables and fruits raw, you know? So they just get the ones that they like the best, you know? So there's that kind of dance. Um, and then we, then we go into other aspects of it. Like, you know, what happens if your kids just refuse to eat them? Well, this is not a short-term project. It's a long-term project. You don't want them eating vegetables for the next month. Who cares about that? You want to be eating vegetables for the rest of their lives. So this is a long-term patient process, you know, with our six, again, who's been the pickiest of eaters uh, in our house. Uh, there's been days where we just, he said, no, I'm not eating this. Make me something different. And the answer is, well, you can make your own something different if you'd like. <laughs> I mean, there's not, there's, there's not a lot different in the house anyway, right? Um, or you can eat that or you can just skip your meal and then you can eat it the next time we're going to eat together as a family. And uh, I, I mean, sometimes there's tears and sometimes there's defiance and stuff like that. But ultimately, you give them choices. You let them make their choices. And after skipping enough meals, he eats. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and we never, and we really never had that problem again. I remember there was like a two-month kind of hairy period where he he was not eating much at all, and he was skipping a lot of meals. And we gave him that choice. And uh, uh, Amanda was starting to, "Are you sure we're doing the right thing here?" And I and I was like, "No, I'm not actually sure." But but I have trust that his hunger and appetite will lead the way. I have trust that if we continue to just give love and support, it's not a battle in any way. It's not like you, well, you're going to eat or you're not going to get anything. No, it's totally, Hey buddy, it's totally your choice, right? There's not other options in the house. If you think you'd like to make something different, go for it. You know, we've, we've taught our kids how to use knives and how to like our four-year-old chops vegetables with the same knife I chop vegetables with. So we've empowered them to do that. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of the psychological aspects around it. So, you know, one is what you're eating. Two is how you're eating uh, and what kind of environment and context, you know, are, are we sitting together as a family or, or at least trying our best to do that? And that doesn't always work, but that's the ideal, you know? And then, um, then there's like, how are you providing support around eating, you know? Are you legitimately a partner with them in the eating process? Or are you dictator, authoritarian leader? You're gonna do it my way because it's my house and that's what I say. Um, that can only go so far, you know? And food and, and meals are one of those areas where dictatorship rarely works, you know? Uh, kids have a couple of slices of autonomy in their lives where they can exert their will and this is one of them, unless you're going to tape their mouth open and stuff the food in, but then they don't have to chew. You know what I mean? So they are the <laughs> ultimate decision maker there. So the sooner you as a parent relinquish that, just give it back to them. It's okay. And then just provide this sort of blanket of support and encouragement and optionality and self-autonomy for them. Like you would do another adult, like you would do a student, an athlete, like you would do a student if you're a professor. You know, with your own children, it, it just goes way better. Um, so those, those, I guess those are my three pieces of advice. Sure. You know, there's pictures about what to eat is what I'd show them, uh, talking about how the context of how you're going to eat. And then third, and I think is probably the most important, how are you going to show up as a parent to this little community of your family uh, to help encourage good food choices without being black and white, without being too authoritarian? Um, you know, and, and my, my thing, you know, 
at Precision Nutrition, this is what we teach all of our coaches, is what we call client-centered coaching. So the idea is that the client, the person, is the uh, governor of their own life. They're the most expert on themselves. And so we have to accept their expertise and use it to inform our recommendations. Um, oftentimes, we don't even have to recommend anything at all. We just have to bring forth their expertise through questions and listening and acceptance. So uh, some of these words feel soft. And I think even to me, as I say them, but it's, it just works so well. You know what I mean? It's really pragmatic. It's not just a philosophical point. It's just when I take into account who you are and what you want, and then integrate what I think is the next step for you somehow, and then let you choose to do that rather than me tell you to do that, you're 10 times more likely to do it. And it works with autonomous adult clients and it works with children as well. This episode is brought to you by Carlisle Performance Training Systems, transforming athletes into champions, located in San Jose, California. Any particular strategies that you would recommend around recovery? Mm -hmm. Recovery after a training session for a parent, or recovery after a game for an athlete, what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, if we're talking about uh, child sport performance or adult recreational exercise, I think the number one thing is just getting enough calories and getting enough protein. If you don't do those two things, there's no shake, there's no pill, there's no massage, there's no you know manual therapist who's going to fix that. Calories and protein, um, and you know a, a perfect example of this is when you look at young female athletes who are under eating and start experiencing what has been traditionally called sort of female athlete triad stuff. What comes from an imbalance of energy? They are expending more than they're taking in. And that manifests as shutdown of the reproductive system, sort of shutdown of uh, energy and oxygenation systems in the body, manifests as fatigue, manifests as hormonal problems. And then, I mean, that's just bad for recovery. And you've seen it. You've seen this happen, unfortunately, in young women where, I, I mean, we're talking about some young women who had amazing athletic potential, and then all of a sudden it's gone. Uh, you know, and I've seen it a lot too, where just from one year to the next, you're like, I, I had a, I had a girl who was number five in the world. And, and now she, uh, she's not, she can't even compete in the region. You know, this is an energy imbalance. It means they're taking in too few calories for what they're expending. Uh, and so number one is sort of always finding that right caloric balance and then getting enough protein. Now, it sounds so basic, but I can look around a room of athletes and I'll tell you like three quarters of them are not doing the job, you know, um, even at the highest levels, you know, I was, you know, for years I was uh, coaching George St. Pierre, the UFC two division champion on nutrition. I remember when I first started working with him, you know, he was so massively under eating that all it took was like a bump up in, in good food calories. And all of a sudden he put on like eight pounds of lean mass and people were like, ah, oh, it's drugs or whatever else. And I'm like, I promise you, you know, it's not that. I mean, you just have a chronically underfed athlete who's experiencing all kinds of side effects from that. And then you feed them enough calories and their training goes great. They put on lean mass, they lose fat. And it's, it, it is, it's almost a drug like effect. Now more calories on top of that does nothing except add body fat. So just getting to that minimum level of calories, protein, and nutrients, right? I mean, you want to get enough vegetables and nuts and nutrient dense foods. And this is where most people are missing it. You know, now let's say you are really conscientious about your eating. You know, you watch what you eat, maybe you follow a specific diet like paleo or whatever. And you're like, no, 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 I'm good, JB. Well, most people following specific diets without some sense of how many calories they're getting are taking in too little anyway. There was a really popular study done not too long ago um, where they looked at, and you remember when the South Beach diet was really popular, they looked at Atkins, you remember when that was hot. They looked at four or five kind of diets 
and they tracked all the people following them. And not a single one of the people, and it was 100 or 200 people, I, I forget the number, um, not a single one was sufficient in nutrients. So they looked at the micronutrients in their food, vitamin A, vitamin C, all these things. And not a single one following one of those popular diets was getting enough nutrition. And this manifests all through the research. You know, years ago, there was this wave of studies looking at children, um, school children, uh, and giving them a multivitamin and a fish oil supplement. And what they found was that there was this massive reduction in what they call antisocial behavior for the kids who got the supplements and uh, an increase in cognitive test performance. And what they did was they, they took this to prison inmates at, and same exact thing happened, almost the same percentage improvements in antisocial behavior going down and cognitive effects, positive cognitive effects. And that's not to say what vitamins and, and fish oil are magic. It's just that what you're looking at is two essentially institutionally fed populations, right? Kids are getting a lot of their food from school and prison inmates are getting all their food from, from the institution. And generally institutional food, including hospital food, is low in nutritional value. Probably sufficient calories in a lot of cases, but not always, but low in nutritional value. And when you boost the nutritional value, you give them all the vitamins and minerals they need and all the essential fatty acids they need, magically they do better. So, and again, then they took this out to people just following popular diets. You know, I think a lot of people who are really conscientious about what they eat start to develop superstitions about certain foods, don't get enough calories, and then they end up in the same exact position. And they're like, well, I, I don't understand what's going on. I'm eating great. Well, you're still underfed calories, underfed protein in some cases, and that is what fixes recovery problems and mood problems and all this kind of stuff, assuming there's no other clinical situation. Now, let's say we even narrow it down. So you see, I'm sort of taking this big funnel, right? I'm yep. saying most people have these two problems. Then there's the people who are eating really healthy. A lot of them still have that problem. Now we have the people who are on the tip of the spear who are eating perfect, right? So now we're talking about an elite athlete who has a nutritionist, who's working with a chef, who's providing the meals for them, which is what eventually, let's say George, for example, St. Pierre had um, with... Uh, you know, I was working closely with his chef who prepared all his meals for him. Now, what do we do in that case? That's where we can start looking at fancier things in terms of recovery, right? That's where we might look at essential amino acid supplements, key intervals throughout the day. That's where we might look at creatine or beta alanine. That's where we might look at things like, I don't know, turmeric or anti-inflammatories, um, things for joint recovery, things for muscle recovery. Um, but I mean, of all the listeners who are listening today, it's going to be very, very few of them who actually need to explore this level. Um, most of them are going to have to work on the base of the pyramid, which is getting enough calories for their activity, getting enough protein and making sure that the calorie, the, the nu nutrients are present in their calories, all the vitamins, all the minerals, all the phytonutrients, all that good stuff. Man, I'll tell you. That's outstanding. On the supplement side, right? Those supplements that you mentioned, turmeric, beta alanine, creatine, you have a lot of athletes, a lot of high school athletes that are using those supplements, a lot of college athletes that are using those supplements. And you mentioned those being, being really applicable at the bottom of the pyramid, so to speak. But they're using them now. What, mm. would, you, what would you say to those athletes who are using those type of supplements just is kind of a, a gunshot approach, right? It's like, yeah, totally. Yeah. And I, I don't even have any problem with that. It's, it's when that displaces the thing that would actually make a difference for them. It's a problem, right? When they're like, no, I got this covered. I'm on my creatine. And it's like, ah, oh, bummer because you're putting your energy into creatine and not eating uh, an extra two pre peanut butter sandwiches a day and, and a protein shake, which is like, this is like my most famous, uh, recommendation for young male athletes who are, want to gain muscle and are in that age demographic, high school, early college, right? So I'm like, I don't care what you eat at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 
I'd sure love you to make some better choices. And here's some ideas on what you could do to do that. But if you want to get enough calories and protein, increase your performance and gain strength and muscle size, um, sure, take your creatine or whatever else you're going to take. But here's what you're going to do um, between all your meals. So yeah, so then what I do is I'm like, here's the simplest thing. Buy some, buy some whole grain bread, get some all natural almond or peanut or cashew butter, uh, get some kind of low sugar jam, mix up a couple sandwiches a day, two, three sandwiches a day, make a protein shake, have that one of those in between each meal. And literally guys are like, I was on creatine for two years and then I did your peanut butter sandwich trick. I gained 15 pounds of lean mass over the next year, you know? And again, you know, so for me, it's just like, fine, creatine, beta alanine, it's cool. Just make sure you're taking stuff that's tested, that doesn't have any banned substances in it. Um, eight years ago, that would have been really hard. Today, it's really, really easy. You know, the NSF website has a um, list of all the products that they certified clean for sport. Uh, there's another one, HFL, which is in Europe and UK. Um, and they, they test products free of banned substances for sport. So if you're tested as an athlete, you're not going to test positive. You take one of these things. Uh, for anyone out there who thinks this isn't serious or is this some kind of a joke, don't. You know, I've worked with so many Olympians and professional athletes who've just taken a supplement uh, because a friend recommended it, because they got it for free in the mail. That's not like the number. Probably when you uh, worked in the NFL, you probably saw this all the time. I see this in, in the NFL all the time. Guys will just get boxes of supplements shipped to them. Yep, yep. They just start taking them, you know? And um, so uh, for me, it's just make sure your stuff's clean. You know, I, I, I right now I have like six examples of athletes I was working with who tested positive uh, at the Olympic level um, because uh, let's say they were using a amino acid supplement that I had recommended, a particular brand that we knew was clean and they ran out and they went to a GNC to buy a replacement instead of getting the brand that we talked about, bam, popped for really micro low, low level of a banned substance and career's over, wow. you know? so. It's no joke. I mean, this this ha uh, there was a study done years ago. Um, you go to any you know nutritional supplement store and pick products off at random. Uh, Twenty five percent of them had banned substances in them. Wow. One in four. Wow. You know, and that's just going to the shop. You know, picking off random supplements. I think they tested seven hundred products. Twenty five percent of them had banned substances in them. Now, probably not enough to hurt your health. You know, if you're just walking in as a consumer, just low, low contamination, but enough to test you positive for the banned substances if you're tested. So, that, you know, for young athletes, for tested athletes, that's super critical. Make sure whatever you're taking is free of banned substances. That's number one. Number two, you know, get your nutritional basics in order. You know, eat enough calories. Again, the simplest way, you know, high school kids are like, I can't eat between meals, right? Like, what am I going to eat? A protein shake and a peanut butter sandwich in your locker. You know, I, I went to high school one time too. And yeah, you know, I had to roll to my locker at some time between classes. Yep. And that's when you scarf it down, you know? That's outstanding. All right. We'll bring this to a close. This has been so informative. Doc, I got a, I got a little side question for you. Talk to me about where you are right now in your sprint events. Give, me, give us some times. Yeah, yeah. So I... Um, I haven't been training much lately, but this, this is this is the, the good but. Okay. So since our our last daughter was born, it was just about two years ago now. I sort of I just knew we're having our fourth kid. There were some big things happening at Precision Nutrition. Uh, Want to be super present as a parent, not like gotta go to the track, see all a few hours. Uh, so I sort of ramped down my my track training. Okay. And. I can't, I, I first started ramping it back up this summer. So I didn't do any meets this summer. I just started easing back in. And this is the number one thing I found that I'm in my mid forties now. I don't know how much sprinting you do now. You're probably way smarter about your training than I am <laughs> and probably more genetically freaky than I am. But for me, if I haven't run regularly for nine or 10 months, like my first workout has to be light drills and no sprints, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so it may take me two months before I even give it, you know, three months, 
you know, people have come to work out at the track with me and they're like, wow, how come we're not sprinting? Because <laughs> we're going to get hurt, old man. You know, So we're going to do dynamics and we're going to do drills. And then maybe after three, four months of training, we start putting in some reps at 30, 50, 80 meters. And then, um, but uh, we're actually spending our winter in Scottsdale this winter. Okay. So we're going to be training with my friends at Altus this winter. Ooh. So I'm really excited because last time I went down to train with them, you know, I dropped my hundred by a 10th. Whoa. So, uh, and that was just over the course of like two, three weeks. So we're going to spend the whole winter down there. We're going to be training with, you know, uh, Stu you know, McMillan, Stu and, yeah, and Dan Paff. Yeah. Stan, uh, Stu, Stu is, one of my closest friends for 15 years. Wow. Uh, I've gotten to know Dan through Stu. Uh, there's a guy I really respect quite a lot and built a good relationship with. So yeah, this winter, me and uh, I'll be training there for sure. The two oldest will come with me as well. They love running, they love competing. So uh, then that'll lead us really nicely into a good season next summer. And then I think probably uh, I'll start doing some meets next summer. Outstanding. I'll be following you. I, I wish I could join you, but uh, I'm on a little hiatus right now. I'm, I'm going to get back into it, though, for sure. You haven't been running? I haven't been sprinting. Had a back injury, mm -hmm. so I've kind of tabled. I'm on the shelf for a little bit, but yeah. I'll be back. Well, look, Doc, I, let me appreciate everything here. This has been outstanding. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to just thank him from the bottom of my heart for sharing the information. I think that this is this is loaded with a lot of great takeaways, a lot of great information that's usable that you can take and put into your into your daily regimen for both a parent and for both an athlete. So thank you very much, Doc. Oh yeah, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. And for everyone who listened all the way through, I thank you for your time. You know, everything I shared today comes from the bottom of my heart as a parent and as a coach as a person you know i mean uh, i'm i'm later in my career I, i'm not as ambitious as i once was and really now it's about being part of the community sharing what i've learned passing that along uh hopefully maybe even inspiring some young people to to come up and get themselves trained and interested in the field and, and starting to do some of the coaching and take the torch that i'm ready to pass on but uh, just thanks for being with us today. And thank you for the questions and the opportunity to chat today. Doc, where can we find more of Dr. John Barati and Precision Nutrition? Yeah, it's really easy. I mean, precisionnutrition.com is where you can come. We write about all these things. We do infographics. We do instructional videos on all this. We've published over a thousand free articles. And so you don't have to buy anything when you get there. Just come hit up our article section and you can do, use our search and find topics on anything. You know, you want to know what what the latest research says on the keto diet. You want to know uh, how to eat for recovery and performance, what you should have post-workout, uh, how to eat healthy on a budget, you know, how to prepare meals for the week in advance, any of that kind of stuff. Just come search it. You'll find free stuff. I think you'll find it valuable. And then, you know, I post periodically on, on Facebook um, at Dr. John Berardi. We share thoughts on all kinds of things from parenting to life to food to nutrition to sport. Uh, so you can come follow me there as well. Well, again, thank you so much. And best of luck with continuing to, to make coaches better in the area of sports nutrition. Let's double it. Let's, let's go ahead and go 200,000, 250 over the next, next couple years. That's the goal, my friend. JB hit on so many different levels. Here are my three key takeaways. One, we talked about how are you showing up that when you're a parent that's supporting your athletic child you're part of a community and if you have a little bit of nutrition knowledge and another parent may not be bringing something healthy and nutritious for the kids to eat for snack don't judge them gain a better understanding of, of where they are and then educate them in the process the second thing I love how he gets his kids to get on board with helping them to eat better. He talked about it. This is not just a short-term deal. It's a long-term deal. He wants his kids to eat better for life. And he's educating them about 
proper nutrition at a very, very young age. It's got these kids cutting vegetables. That's pretty cool when they're six years old. And the third thing he talked about is when your child is participating in a practice or sport, maximize that time. Work out. Be active. Go for a walk. Do something. JB, Dr. John Barati, he gets into the into the fray with the kids. His daughter's practicing gymnastics. He took a gymnastics class or he hired a gymnastics coach. He was active. He did something while they were doing something in parallel while they were doing something so that he was maximizing their time and not just necessarily sitting there and just reading a book, particularly for those who aren't getting the work in during a given day. We only have so much time. He talked about how he added up the hours with respect to how much time he dedicates to supporting his kids, 25 total hours a week. It's almost a full-time job. So we got to find those gaps where we can maximize our time to do the things that we need to do in order to stay fit, be fit and stay fit. So with that being said, I want to thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe to the show. We'd love to get your comments and feedback. We will have these notes on my website. We'll have a transcript on my website. You can find it at coachcarlisle.com forward slash 21. You plug that in, take you to the podcast episode, but also you can go onto the website and you can download a PDF transcript of this unbelievable content. If you're in the area, stop by and visit us. Would love to talk to you about training. And in the meantime, in between time, have a blessed day. Mm-hmm.